everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and today we're going to leave no dye behind by rinsing out some stock solution bottles. And we're not just going to rinse out the insides, but seeing there's some like dried patches on the outside. Here there was a dried patch on the bottom of a container that must have been a brown, and I will use like a spoon to actually dissolve all that in a minute, but this is part of our leftover color. Now, when I store stock solutions, I store them inside a secondary container like this, so that way there's a plastic container that can catch any drips in case we ever get dye on the bottom of a bottle uh, because of a drip down or something, then it doesn't damage the under the sink where I keep all of these. I try to also keep them in a dark area so that way uh, the dyes don't spoil because even if you use sterile water to dissolve your dyes, uh, and just had a bottle of sterile water, sometimes you can get something to end up growing in it, which, you know, ideally you would like to avoid. Anyway, we're gonna be emptying out these bottles onto some Wool of the Andes Worsted Weight yarn. This yarn is 100% Peruvian Highland wool. I have 200 grams of here that I've pre-soaked for a couple of hours today, and we're gonna bring this momentarily over to a catering steam pan which is warm with leftover acid in it, but will likely cool off as I add more water. And we're gonna start layering these dyes on in a kind of time lapse here today. Well, actually in a time lapse because I'm gonna be dissolving dyes and water and thinking and I think that that's the way I wanna do this today. But before we jump into our dyeing project, if you wanna learn more about the yarn bases or any of the other tools and equipment that I'm using in my videos, I do have links and affiliate links down in the video description, and I might earn a commission if you make a purchase after clicking on one of the affiliate links. Now here we are at my four inch deep full-size catering steam pan. And in here, there is water that had two tablespoons of white vinegar originally, about eight cups of water, but we've also added a fair amount of citric acid because I was speckling in this pan earlier today. And I don't have a volume of citric acid that I've added, but that just means that we have more acid in here. Now, as I bring over our yarn, it's worth mentioning our yarn is not super wash. And I currently do not have the heat on the stove right here. So yes, I'm adding cool yarn into a warm pan, but we're gonna be adding on cool liquid throughout the process today as I dissolve our bottles of, almost empty bottles of dye with water to randomly layer these colors on. And I don't know what kind of color we're gonna end up with because whatever we get, we could always go and pick some color that isn't a leftover color if we wanted more on here, and we'll just see where things go. I started off with that brown that was at the bottom of the container. I think that that is likely pecan brown based on the color that it looks like and one of the other bottles I know I still have in my stock solution bottle. Other colors include remnants of royal purple, emerald green, Caribbean blue, brilliant yellow, electric violet, deep magenta, maybe some royal purple, I think, and also maybe some colors I don't have labeled anymore. Lately, I haven't been using stock solutions and my stock solution storage as much because as time has progressed, I have shifted more to, well, in general, I like playing with dry dye powders and using that directly on yarn, but also, if I need a dye stock, I've been mixing up my dyes in sort of random volumes of water and using it up as close to when I've originally mixed it as possible. And one reason for this is that having too much leftover dyes sometimes puts me in a little bit of a color rut. Because if I have a liter of a color, and if that color is not a primary, and some of these are remnants of primaries, and those are worth having as stocks, but say I have a liter of emerald green, which is a very pigmented green, I then I'm gonna to need to use it in a lot of videos to just not waste that color that I've mixed. And then that makes me feel like I'm using the same colors over and over and that my videos might be repetitive. 
And well, there's certainly elements to these videos that are repetitive because I say things like the links in the description or subscribe and turn on notifications, blah, 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 over and over in my videos. I do try to mix up the techniques and the colors and the yarn bases so that way you are continuing to explore color and yarn and technique and yarn together with me. But getting back to why I haven't been making as many dye stocks, honestly, sometimes it's a pain. There are some colors like Caribbean blue that when you go to dissolve it, it clumps. And it's a little bit of a pain to get that to dissolve. And so making a one liter stock of this color is annoying. <laughs> and that's really the biggest reason. Sometimes I'd rather just know how much dye I've measured out, but not worry about the volume. And so then I know, okay, I'm not gonna be using over one gram of dye here because that's the amount I measured out. And so what I'm making isn't necessarily reproducible, but at least I have like an upper limit of how much dye I'm using. And so that is something that I guess has fit my mood a lot more lately. Of course, if you dye a lot of reproducible colorways, you're going to want to have recipes that you can reproduce. And one great way to do that is by making dye stocks. But sometimes I just don't feel like it. And this is me being perfectly honest. Now some colors dissolve beautifully, like true black, toner black, um, dark navy. I don't think those ones have been ever been challenging. But there are other colors that just don't dissolve well at all. And I mean, Caribbean blue does dissolve well in the end. But yeah, I mean, I feel like there was a video that I was working on recently and I needed to make some dye stocks for it. And I haven't looked at the footage, but I feel like it took me over an hour to finish making those stocks. Now having those stocks made is gonna benefit me in multiple videos. And so that's a really good thing. So I don't like doing it when I need to do it, but I like having it done. And let me go, ah, the timer from another project. <laughs> Lots of interruptions right now. A big reason why I selected this non-superwash 100% Peruvian Highland wool, wool of the Andes yarn, which honestly I can't remember if I said the fiber content, even though that was max 10 minutes ago when I started the intros for this video. The main reason why I chose this yarn base is that I know it doesn't absorb color super fast. So while I am adding on the small amounts of whatever dye I am removing from these various containers, I know I'm going to be able to spread that color a little bit. So we're not going to get like a little bit of color in a tiny area left on the yarn, which in some places we may, depending on, you know, how much I decide to move the yarn as I'm adding these dyes on. But it means that I'm not going to have something that feels like there's a big section of area that didn't get any color at all because that's not quite what I'm going for today. But as for what I'm going for, I'm gonna see what these colors are gonna do on the yarn, which is one of my favorite ways in the entire world to dye yarn. And I know that I'm probably watching Grey's Anatomy or something and just enjoying the free flowing process of playing with these colors and seeing how they all mix together. My gut says it could end up being fairly warm toned uh, with the colors that I have with the yellows and pinks, but it really comes down to how much Caribbean blue is left in that bottle, I suppose, because if there's a lot of blue there, then all bets are off. Maybe we'll, things could end up being pretty purple, actually, now that I'm looking at the colors again, but I haven't actually started applying the dye yet, so I do not yet know, but let's, uh, well, you've now come through the journey, and so real time Rebecca's about to pop back in. We ended up with something rainbowish. It's sort of like a musty rainbow, a dirty rainbow, but this is pretty, and there's a lot more pigment here than I anticipated. I just turned the heat back on. The water in here cooled off really quickly, but I'm gonna add a fair amount of acid. I don't know how much these colors will or won't spread out. But it's funny because even with like screw caps on and stuff, 
the amount of dye that was like dried or at the bottom of some of these, it was interesting. Uh, but I do like what we have. I like this rainbow feel and that wasn't even what I thought I was necessarily going for. It was a lot more yellow than I expected. This is like a really pretty, it's all really pretty. I don't know. I really, really like it. Um, but warm toned. It is warm toned. But anyway, I am going to heat this up until we start to see some movement at the surface. Then I'll reduce the heat to low and we're going to heat it for 30 minutes. Our green has kind of faded to a more golden color. But after 30 minutes, the dye bath is clear. And I'm curious. Ooh, we've got some dark patches down there. What the reverse side looks like. Ooh. Ooh, we have some greens down there. And some deeper orange patches. Ooh, pretty. Ooh, and some yellow. Ooh. That's very fun. Okay, but I'm now going to turn off the heat. Because I forgot to do that before. I'm going to remove the yarn so that it decide to cool. But overall, warm toned, yes. Lots more pigment than I expected, too. Once the yarn is completely cool, then we can wash it. I'm still surprised we had as much pigment in here as we did. But now I just have to hope that we're not going to see any bleeding. One of the colors I knew we did have a fair amount of was, I think, some fluorescent fuchsia in one of the tiny bottles. But, honestly, there may have been more deep magenta from what was dried on the side of the bottle. So, I don't really know. I just, fluorescent fuchsia can be a bleeder. So, that's something that I just have to think about. But it's amazing how a lot of these colors were colors that, and I'm, I've got some dish soap now on my hands. A lot of these colors were dye stocks that I used up what was left in the live stream, but I just hadn't rinsed out the bottle yet. And I had saved all of these empties in a secondary container under my sink for an, um, almost an unreasonably long period of time before finally filming this video. Uh, and some of those bottles were honestly hard to clean, but I did use... <laughs> some kind of scrub brush that I rigged onto a knife so I could try to scrub the inside of the bottle. You do the best that you can. But anyway, I love when I can create something so pretty and almost magical out of something that otherwise could have just gone down the drain. Now, I've talked about this before. The reason why I started doing Leave No Dye Behind originally was back when I was dyeing yarn with food coloring and I'd mix things up and I'd have color left over after hand painting in one of my old apartments in Illinois. Back then Chemnitz wasn't a full-time job or anything. I was making videos and writing blog posts and hoping to make enough to cover the cost of materials. And so those materials that I had were very, very precious. Uh, and so that was one reason why I started that in the beginning. But then as time went on, I wanted to use up as much dye as possible so that way there's less waste. Um, and so not only did I create a beautiful colorway with dye that otherwise would have been discarded, and so that saved money, it also saved pigments from going out into the water treatment system, right? And so that's a win-win-win in my opinion. But anyway, I'm gonna go put the yarn through my spin dryer and then we'll hang it up to dry and see what the finished yarn looks like. And I'm very thankful we saw no color bleeding. I'm always thankful whenever that happens. Not that bleeding happens very often, but I'm always thankful when I don't see it. <laughs> Here is our finished yarn and I adore how it turned out. I mean, I think I've probably said that already, but one of my favorite parts are areas like this, where we see some hints of the blue. Now, this isn't exactly color breaking because we layered each of the colors on separately, but we had some of those pinks sort of layer and strike more in some places than others, giving us, I mean, you could describe it as patchy, but Patchy feels like it's not a good word. It gives it some more variation. It makes it more variegated, and I think that that's lovely. 
Another such patch is right here where we see more of the yellow, see some of that peeking through the orange. And this is just one perk of layering, again, the colors individually, because yes, we had acid in our container and the heat went away pretty quickly soon after I added any liquid, but enough of the colors kind of stayed where I placed them. And that's just really exciting. It can be hard to predict sometimes how different pigments might behave on different types of yarn bases, superwash versus non-superwash. Some colors, even with no additional acid, with my particular tap water, will strike so fast, cold, no acid, and then others don't. And so sometimes I am surprised with how things turn out. Because even though I'm getting a reasonable handle on the colors, on a lot of the dye colors I have, when you have so many different pre-mixed colors, sometimes you have a better feel of how some of them behave versus others. And this comes with experience. And so it was a lot easier with food coloring. I could kind of look at the mixture of food coloring and know, ooh, I think this is what's gonna happen. But in the US there's five food coloring uh, molecules that are in most like icing color, liquid food coloring and stuff. And so you're dealing with a mixture of the same five things over and over. It makes it easy to predict how things behave. And when you're dealing with unknown proportions, but also more probably than five pigments here, uh, it can be harder to anticipate and predict, which makes something like this so much more fun because I didn't know where we were gonna end up and we ended up someplace really awesome. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and please subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. I post one to two videos a week, but we also have bonus live streams and things, and so ringing that bell, having those notifications on, is the best way to find out when new content is coming. But generally, every Tuesday morning, Eastern Time, I do have a new video, most Fridays, and we'll see how the schedule goes for the rest of 2023. In addition to subscribing, you can join to become a channel member and get access to a lot of fun Chemnitz-themed emotes that you can use in the comments and in live stream chats. And while well, there's other places you can support me on the internet, lots of links down in the video description below. Thank you so much for watching.